Thank you for joining us today for this important uh, and timely discussion focusing on the status of Arab women and the progress uh, towards Arab women's rights on the occasion of International Women's Day. My name is Tamara Kharoub. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and Senior Research Fellow at Arab Center Washington, D.C. I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar. As you know, March 8th uh, marks International Women's Day, which was first ob observed in 1911 um, in March in Western capitals, but it wasn't until um, 1977 that the United Nations adopted it globally as a day to educate the public, mobilize for change, and celebrate the achievements made. More than a century later, women in both developed and developing countries continue to face discrimination and challenges in all aspects of social, economic, and political life. According to uh, the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, it will take 135.6 years to close uh, the gender gap worldwide, which is worse than it was last year. In the Middle East and North Africa in particular, women rank worst on the, uh, in the world uh, on the gender gap index, which uh, assesses access to health, education, economic advancement, and political participation. Uh, in the MENA region, it will take 142.4 years to close, to close the gender gap. Um, for example, women's participation in the workforce is very low in the Arab world at 25%, which is half of the global average, despite higher education levels among women uh, in the region. 17% um, of women work in, in, in non-agricultural fields, um, so only 17%. In terms of political participation, 7% of parliamentary seats in the Arab world only uh, are held by women, uh, which is, um, you know, very low compared to the global average of 25%, which is still low, by the way. Um, regarding access to communication and information, 48% uh, of women in the Arab world, that is 84 million women, do not have a mobile phone. Uh, the gender gap in internet access is 34% in the region, which is the second largest in, in the world. Um, these inequalities, as we know, uh, are aggravated by conflicts and crises like the COVID-19 pandemic, authoritarianism, and violence. Uh, women are disproportionately affected by conflict, and yet they continue to be grossly underrepresented in peace building and uh, conflict resolution efforts and in uh, political litigations. And we haven't even started talking about issues like sexual harassment, gender-based violence, personal status laws, patriarchal norms, and, and so on. So overall, uh, while Arab women have been at the forefront of political and social mobilization and national movements in their country, they remain to be systematically excluded from public life. And the, on the other side of this, um, the issue of Arab and Muslim women is highly sensationalized in Western media and politics, and women are often portrayed and treated as mere victims. At today's webinar, um, we want to address uh, a few questions. Uh, one of them is, do Arab women have reason to celebrate this International Women's Day? Uh, what is the current status of women's rights in the Arab world? What progress has been made? And what are the factors hindering this progress? And um, are there, you know, what are the remaining challenges facing Arab women today? Whether they're legal frameworks, societal norms, authoritarian and patriarchal structures, conflict or others. And finally, what measures should be taken to address these obstacles and disparities to support Arab women in achieving equal rights, freedoms, and opportunities? To answer these questions, uh, we are very fortunate to have an excellent panel of experts who have taken the time to be with us today, especially for um, some of them, uh, it's midterm exams and, and they're very busy grading. Uh, so thank you for, for taking the time to join us. And, um, share your, your insights. I will briefly introduce the panelists in a speaking order. Lina Abirafa is a global women's rights expert and gender equality advocate. She's also senior advisor for global women's rights in the Arab Institute for Women at the Lebanese American University. Uh, Yara Asi is assistant professor in the School of Global Health Management and Informatics at the University of Central Florida. She's also a non-resident fellow with us at Arab Center Washington DC. Marwa Shalabi is Assistant Professor in Gender and Women's Studies and in Political Science at University, at University of Wisconsin-Madison, 
And Aziz Nosair is Associate Professor of Women's Studies and International Studies at Denison University. Uh, I these are just very brief introductions. Each one of them has a very long bio that I encourage you to, to look up online. Uh, thanks to all of you for, for joining us and for uh, putting the time to be with us today for this hour and a half, and I look forward to your contributions. Uh, before we start the discussion, just some housekeeping items. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit your questions at any time during the discussion using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Uh, for those watching on um, our websites and social media platforms, you can send your questions by email to events at arabcenterdc.org, events at arabcenterdc.org. Please identify yourself and affiliation and indicate to whom your question is addressed. We'll try to take as many questions as we can. Uh, the format for today is, is pretty straightforward. For those of you who attend our webinars, we follow the same format more or less each time. I will give each one of the panelists um, 10 to 12 minutes to answer some questions and present their remarks, and then we'll spend the last 30 minutes uh, answering questions from uh, the audience. And with that, um, let's start the discussions. Uh, first, we start with uh, Lina. Uh, Lina, this time last year, you wrote an article about how, uh, why you hate International Women's Day. And I think you uh, wrote another article again this year. Uh, can you explain a little bit uh, why you hate International Women's Day? And do Arab women have um, reason to celebrate today? Uh, what is the status of Arab women and their rights? And if you could situate it within the larger uh, global context, what challenges are uh, region specific and what factors can are hindering this, this progress? And then I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and other international mechanisms, do they help or hamper uh, this cause? Especially that the Arab countries uh, have reservations and there is some internal opposition from some political and community leaders. I know these are a lot of questions, but um, we'd appreciate it if you can try to address as many as you can. Lina, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And yes, this is in the context of our so-called International Women's Day, um, a day I do undeniably hate. Uh, there are many of us, I think, uh, probably present in this virtual space who do this every day. So what is International Women's Day really? It's a day where I and those of us uh, here together have to do much more of what we already do every single day and do it for free. So yes, I take a lot of issue with International Women's Day. Um, and every year I seem to write the same piece because every year uh, we don't make the gains that I'd like to see. I've worked on women's rights now for over 25 years. I've covered 20 countries, um, some in the Arab region, but mostly outside. Um, and my patience is, uh, is growing quite thin. You asked me to situate this in terms of uh, the global landscape. Let me start there. Uh, you very rightly said that we are um, many, many hundreds of years, 136 years actually away from equality and closing the gender gap. Uh, last year, it's worth noting, we were 100 years away. So we've gotten worse. We've added a generation now, another generation that has to wait for equality. Why? Well, it's primarily due to COVID, actually massive setbacks in terms of uh, women's rights and equality and any gains made, resources allocated and so on. And I'll speak to that in a little bit because um, COVID is the kind of the elephant in the room now. We cannot avoid um, discussing the impact that that has made on women's rights uh, and responsibilities globally. But really, uh, the problem is that no country in the world has achieved equality. Not a single one, not even Iceland, because everywhere in the world, women and girls still aren't able to fully participate in all aspects of social, economic, and certainly not political life. Where we have less choice, we have less voice, and it seems to be the burden of women to be able to rectify this imbalance, to fix a problem that actually we didn't cause. I mean, we constantly have to, to solve this problem, advocate for our own equality, uh, insist on rights that are rightfully ours, um, and, you know, where is everybody else? Where is the righteous anger about all of this? I mean, we know that this isn't just about women and girls. Gender equality is better for everyone. There is no possibility of any kind of a safe, sustainable, peaceful, prosperous future without full equality. We've said it, the research shows it. We know that every single country in the world, it's not about the type of government or the state of the economy, although, although those things certainly help. It is about how a country treats its women. So when we talk about things like the gender gap, we talk about the gap in education. Okay, that's actually 
getting a little bit better, but still, even though we are maybe 12 years away from closing the education gap, the majority of those who are out of school, children out of school are girls. The majority of those who are illiterate are women. We're talking about two thirds of those who are illiterate are women and girls, which is about half a billion women and girls who still can't read or write. I mean, if we're talking about basic literacy now, what, what year is it? I mean, to me, this is unfathomable. When we talk about politics, you mentioned some of the statistics that are staggering. Uh, we are virtually invisible in all aspects of leadership, positions of power, uh, decision-making authority. In political spaces, it is unbelievable that there are so many countries, close to 100 countries, have never had a woman leader. And I think those are the countries that would really benefit from having one. They would be a lot better off. Uh, discrimination is embedded in laws in our systems, uh, billions actually of women and girls live in countries that have discriminatory laws on paper. So uh, what laws that dictate what women can and can't do, needing husband's permission and so on. Poverty, conflict, insecurity, all of those things affect women and girls much more. In the economy, women's unemployment is higher, women are relegated to the informal sector, women do, um, more of the unpaid work, uh, they take greater risks in doing it. COVID has made all of that worse. And all of these things, you know, you take all the stuff and put it in the Arab region, and it's just that much worse. For me, though, the biggest challenge we have is violence against women. And as long as that continues to exist, all of the things that we have, the rights, the benefits, the opportunities, the progress or regress is rendered moot because we know globally one in three women and girls will experience some form of violence in their lifetime. One in three probably underestimates the reality. We're talking about over 80% of women who've experienced some form of sexual harassment, verbal or physical. We're talking about child marriage, girl child marriage to be precise, which ultimately boils down to rape of a girl child, right? We need to be a little bit more precise with our terms because we tend to forget uh, how, how dangerous they are, how alarming they are. We're talking about 15 million girls under the age of 18 that are married every single year, which I believe is to the tune of 40,000 girl child marriages a day. That for me is absolutely shocking. Um, and we know what happens when a girl is married under the age of 18. We know what happens to her health and her life and her education or if opportunities and even her children and so on. The spillover effect is huge. Um, female genital mutilation, uh, that as well, millions every year and millions more as a result of COVID. Same for girl child marriage, millions more as a result of COVID. Um, so as long as these forms of violence persist, we are in a lot of trouble. And then add to that COVID, obviously, all of the pre-existing gender inequalities that women and girls face are magnified. And what does what that meant? That's meant that the challenge is this, that COVID is an emergency and we're still not out of it. We will not be out of the, the effects of that for, for possibly a generation in terms of the reallocation of resources, the, the, the challenges to women in the economy and access to public and political life, uh, the public health components, certainly, uh, what has happened at the domestic level in terms of intimate partner violence, all of these things. I mean, in any, any emergency, and I've worked in about 20 of them, um, Women's rights and freedoms are the first to be stripped away and they are the last to be revived and COVID is no exception to that. So what has happened to women's burden of unpaid care? What's happened to girls' education? I talked about FGM, violence against women. I've talked about that. So we have a lot of challenges. And in the Arab region, take all of that and it's going to be much, much worse. And it has been. We're talking about a region that is very patriarchal. Um, that is uh, that has multiple protracted crises that show no signs of abating, that already has backlashes against women's rights and fundamental freedoms at every step. And even when we do make progress, it's matched with massive regress. So we're really not able to make any gains. I mean, we talked about, you mentioned, 142 years until the gender gap in the Arab region is closed. I do not plan to live that long. So my recommendation for all of us is that we speed it up because actually that is unacceptable. I cannot believe that we are still arguing for this. Even when no Arab country is in the top 100 gender gap, and that we're, we're not doing well at all. You know, you ask, do we have reason to celebrate? It's a difficult question because yes, we always have reason to celebrate. We are resilient, we continue to fight. We are advocating for our rights, for equality, for dignity, respect, for space, for choice, for voice. Yes, we have reason to celebrate. But if celebrate means slack, then no, because actually we have a lot of work to do.
you were asking about CEDAW and other international measures. Those are standards to which we, we need to um, we need to live up to those standards. Those are benchmarks and guidelines that should actually be non-negotiable. I'm part of a project called uh, Equal Measures 2030 that looks at how far we are from achieving SDGs, and we are far. And it's a feminist founded data and advocacy project that, that promotes uh, the SDGs and tells us where we're at. And for the Arab region, progress has been, I think they said some progress, but overall the score is poor, including some backsliding. And in particular, we rank lowest in terms of our presence in political bodies. Uh, in parliament, ministerial roles, well below the global average. So what are we going to do about all of this? I mean, how much more fight can we continue to put on? What I see is um, a context where the conflicts, the insecurities, patriarchy, uh, social norms, things that exist like male guardian systems, all of that stuff um, has constantly worked against us. But there is a young generation of women who are out on the streets, who are fighting, who are leading social movements, who are advocating for change, who are pushing for their rights, who are doing it in a way that is organic and intersectional. And that for me is really inspiring. Um, I feel like they are much more firm in terms of what is non-negotiable. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see, I'd like to retire. I'm sure many of Many of my fellow panelists feel the same. Um, we are losing our voice from how much we are screaming. But what I would like to do is take all of that anger um, and energy and channel it into something useful, supporting this young generation, being the mentors that we now are supposed to be. I say this as an older woman um, for the young generation to be able to lead that charge for change, to be able to finish the stuff that we haven't been able to finish, to be able to guarantee that that in terms of access to education, girls are not discriminated against and not pulled out of school at the at the sign of the, fir of the first emergency, that women have full rights to health care, including sexual and reproductive health and rights. We need to own our own bodies and our health care, our bodily autonomy and integrity um, is one of the things that is constantly compromised, not just in the region, but around the world. Still, in the region, we lack comprehensive sex education and we constantly exist in ignorance about our own bodies. We don't control our own reproductive lives. So for me, that's also not acceptable. At work, we continue to be relegated to overly feminized sectors and the young generation needs to fight to make sure that they've got space at the at the proverbial table you know how much are we going to keep fighting at the same table um, with our uh, with our folding chair that we have to bring ourselves you know i really think what i would like to see uh, in spaces like that in um, economic life and in political life is for men and boys to also step aside, to pass the mic, to be allies and advocates and champions for change. We're not seeing this enough. And so I constantly am asking, you know, where are the guys? Uh, where are the guys in um, supporting um, women and girls in creating space in passing the mic in, in not being perpetrators in standing up? I would really like to see more of that and I don't see enough of it. So let me end, um, I have no idea how much time I have left, but just to say again, should we celebrate? Sure, should we be slack? No, because celebrate means solidarity. And for me more than anything, celebrate means speed up. Thank you, Lena, for this comprehensive, uh, all by depressing overview and for a little bit of a hopeful note at the end. Um, I think there are very many inspirational voices out there and, and we can celebrate them at least. Um, next, uh, we have Yara. Um, Yara, Lina mentioned um, that, you know, there's no equality anywhere in the world today for women, um, but the Arab region is among the worst, if not the worst in, in the world. Uh, what combination of factors um, makes inequality or gender inequality, particularly pronounced in the Arab world? Um, are there areas where women have achieved a little bit of equality and um, which areas continue to be, to have the largest uh, disparity? Um, also your, your expertise um, with healthcare and, and development. Can you tell us a little bit about women's access to um, services, basic services in healthcare and how women are um, 
also affected by conflict and climate change. I think climate change is one of the very important issues of our time. And uh, women tend to be uh, disproportionately affected. So if you can touch on that a little bit, um, that would be great. And the last question for you, um, uh, you've done some work um, on, on development. What is the role of international aid and development agencies uh, in this cause? Is it positive, is it negative? Uh, what is your assessment of that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tamara. Um, and thank you, Lena. I do think that was a good introduction, I think, for the rest of the conversation. Um, so I will try attempt to answer these questions as comprehensively as possible. And I invite um, the audience to ask for follow up in the Q&A uh, if there's anything unclear. So the first question, I feel like, you know, this could be an entire this is a book, this is a dissertation in and of itself. Um, you know, what combination of factors make these disparities so pronounced in this specific region? This is a really complex question, and it's often boiled down to one factor, which is religion. Uh, most people assume that, well, you know, most of these countries are Muslim, Islam is an inherently conservative religion, and so that must translate to the gender norms that privilege men. Um, and, you know, religion is, of course, a piece of this answer, but it does not explain the diversity in how religion is practiced around the region, and of course by Muslim women that don't live in the region, and how women's freedoms have vacillated over time, you know, including in just the past few decades. Um, and of course, most of the world's major religions have patriarchal foundations and have norms that privilege men. Almost all religions have subgroups that are particularly adherent to practices and norms that privilege men and even explicitly state that the role of women is to be a wife and mother and caretaker and, you know, all these all these pieces of the household, um, including norms that influence how women should dress, including covering their hair, although it is almost exclusively Muslim women that are associated with these practices. So while it's part interpretations of religion. A lot of research shows that there's a lot of other factors that mediate how religion and how overall attitudes towards gender are expressed, depending on the household and, of course, the community. Um, for example, do you live in an urban or rural setting? So, you know, we tend to see that households and communities in urban settings are a little more egalitarian than more rural settings. Um, what about the education level of the father or the experiences of the father or the other patriarch of the family? That has a huge role. Socio socioeconomic status obviously plays a significant role, although some of the richest countries in the region have some of the most uh, stringent gender guidelines and for social norms in the immediate area. So, I mean, everyone always talks about the Middle East as a monolith, but look at Beirut compared to, you know, the Gaza Strip and it's completely different. You, you really can't put it all in one box. Um, then, of course, you have these societal factors like recent histories of colonialism and histories of and ongoing conflict that exacerbate gender inequalities for a variety of reasons. I mean, let's remember most of these countries were just established in the early to mid 1900s. So these scars from colonial rule, from conquest, from conflict have not healed and in many cases are ongoing. And while these don't cause gender inequalities, they do make existing inequalities worse. Um, and they have contributed to this massive regional instability that has caused trauma that is disproportionately felt by women and the households that they are supposed to manage. Um, so there are so many intersecting factors that contribute to the gender disparities in the Middle East. And aside from being ingrained in norms and expectations, unfortunately, in many countries, you've seen these uh, be codified into laws that are difficult to unwind once they are in place. Um, so a bit of good news, you know, you asked in what arenas have Arab women achieved gender equality and um, where are the largest disparities? So to start with the good news, we have seen some extremely significant jumps in women's educational attainment in recent decades. So for example, in 1970, just 17% of women in the MENA region were enrolled in secondary school. Whereas in 2019, it was almost 80%, and this is just 3% below men. And I mean, you talk to professors from the region and they are, they, they notice the difference in the composition of their classrooms. You know, my, my grandmother uh, was raised in a village in the West Bank and she was never even taught to read. And then you look at her daughter, my mother, and she has two master's degrees. So there's been this huge generational jump 
long overdue, of course. Um, one of the main problems, however, is that we're not seeing this translate to employment, um, as Tamara, as you noted earlier. Women's unemployment in many Arab states is significantly higher than men's. In some cases, it's double the rate of men's unemployment. Um, it's important to realize that for many industries in most countries, men hold disproportionately higher ranking positions and make more than their female counterparts. This is not specific to any Arab state, um, but in the MENA region, this is pronounced and we can't overlook that. A big reason for this is that women perform more unpaid caregiving work as compared to men. Um, they perform, and I, I, this is an average, uh, but of about six hours of unpaid work per day as compared to less than one hour for men. So maybe you are an educated woman, but you are expected to have children, care for them, care for elderly or disabled relatives. In some cases, you're caring for younger siblings. Maybe you're caring for the children of your own siblings or other family members. And of course, you have to do the majority of the cooking and the cleaning and the household management. And then in some countries, there may be restrictions on your movement. Maybe you need to travel with a chaperone or an escort or something. The prospect of securing full-time uh, employment is very daunting. So um, then when you have women in the workplace and they're experiencing, you know, they're ignored, they're demoralized, they're harassed, they're passed over for promotions or raises, then that is another factor that, that can keep women from attaining full uh, employment. Um, when we look at access to health care, so first it's important to realize that public health throughout the Arab region, you know, regardless of gender, is poor. Um, and yet again, this is one of those instances where an existing disparity is just made worse by gender inequality. Um, so, you know, you have to look at, does the state have universal health care? Are you a citizen of the state or are you a migrant worker? Because there's a huge disparity there. Um, does, is your country even politically stable enough to have a robust health system and sufficient personnel and all the equipment that you need? So this is the first tier of access. Is it even there for you? Then you have more household specific factors like income, distance to a health facility, and again, whether the woman is allowed to travel independently at her own discretion. So I would say the level of women's access to health care and other social services is highly variable and it's dependent on both the functioning of the country she lives in, as well as the level of egalitarianism in her household or community. When you look at conflict and climate change, which you rightly bring up as I think the, the overarching problems of our time, again, they do not create gender inequalities, but they magnify inequalities of all kinds. So this is between rich and poor, uh, people with disabilities versus able-bodied people, or between men and women. Um, so in conflicts, for example, we might see men more likely to join militaries or militias. We're seeing this in Ukraine right now. Uh, men may be more likely to die or be imprisoned. They're more likely to be able to go abroad to work, to send money home. Um, so while women are left behind, you know, they're already performing an outsized role in caregiving, and now they're essentially left alone as a breadwinner as well. Um, so men are more likely to die in conflict, but a lot of research shows us that women and children are more likely to die in the long term from kind of these structural meltdowns. Um, when you look at climate change, it's, it's a very similar dynamic. When you have a region that already has high food and water insecurity, as, as the MENA region does, um, where it's already hard enough to grow food because arable land is decreasing and freshwater stores are low, um, then when you have a woman who's responsible for feeding and bathing and taking care of the family, they're going to be the ones contending with these tangible outcomes first. Um, and then you have families that are dependent on agriculture and there are parts of the Middle East where an agricultural livelihood is just simply not going to be possible in the coming decades. So what happens to those women? What happens when they become displaced? What happens when the breadwinner of the family loses their livelihood? And then you have natural disasters and the physical and mental effects of flooding and heat waves and sandstorms and land degradation that are going to significantly and disproportionately impact women. Um, it's going to be very hard to cope with these changes. Um, so I will end on this, this talk about international aid and development agencies. I think these agencies talk very well about gender inequality, um, but then in policies we see this disconnect between words and actions. Women, especially in the Middle East, are poorly represented as policymakers on any number of issues, health, 
war, climate policy, transportation, energy policy, even domestic policies that impact women directly, like paid family leave, etc. So I think these agencies that have spent billions in this region um, in, in humanitarian efforts and countries that have spent billions in this region, um, you know, with arms, really need to take a look at who is making the policies and who they are meant to be for. Um, I recently did a study about COVID-19 response plans in humanitarian emergencies, many of which are in the Middle East, and none were considered gender transformative. Most of them that consider gender at all focus exclusively on gender-based violence, pregnancy, reproductive care, these very women-centered sectors. Um, they're not really considering gender in all other aspects of life because inequalities exist everywhere. And, and these are the humanitarian agencies themselves that are calling for days like International Women's Day and all these initiatives. Um, so we need to recognize that in many issues, women have unique insights that help us understand societal challenges. And this is why it's so important that we have diverse people with a seat at that table that Lena, uh, you know, rightly kind of disparaged because we're, we're tired of hearing about the table. Um, but I think you see this unfounded assumption that making gender related policy decisions is too disruptive, too controversial. You know, this country is already in a war. Let's, we'll worry about this later, 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 later. Um, and what we don't realize is that the system, this broken system that we have, is what has led to these crises to begin with. So if these development and humanitarian agencies want to uplift and empower populations, they need to stop contributing to the same structures uh, that keep us in this cycle of dependence. And then lastly, I think a lot of these agencies have to take a look in the mirror, so to speak. You know, we have a lot of organizations preaching gender equality, while at the same time, many of them are run by men, have always been run by men. Many of them have mostly men in leadership decisions, even if the people on the ground on the front lines are poorly paid women. And several of them have had issues with sexual harassment or sexual assault uh, cases, either in staff or of staff towards local populations of women. So I think aid agencies need to elevate, support, and protect women and the needs of women, both the women in their own organizations and, of course, the women in the populations that they are mandated to serve if, if they want to be taken seriously as leaders on this issue. Thank you, Yara, for, for this uh, excellent um, presentation. Uh, very important issues and some questions that were raised. Um, next, we um, have Maiwa. Uh, Maiwa, um, I wanna ask you a little bit more about um, political participation and in political empowerment for women and representation in, in, in politics, um, parliamentary politics, but also in, in other leadership positions um, in the Arab countries. How do women fare in, in politics in general? Is um, their participation, whether by the quota system or other things, is it just cosmetic and limited, or or do women actually have um, real uh, opportunities for leadership and, and for change? Um, and, and the other questions, which I think Yara alluded to, is you know this delay of the women's agenda that this is not the time for women's rights. Um, there are many people who say um, you know. The women's agenda is secondary to what the Arab world is going through now, whether it's um, you know the democratic agenda under authoritarian rule or um, facing conflicts and violence, and, and you know you have climate change, you have the the healthcare crisis and the global the COVID nineteen pandemic. What do you say to people who um, view this women's agenda as secondary to all of these other um, issues that some people consider more urgent? And um, lastly, some people consider the Arab Spring as a turning point for women, uh, whether it's a, a positive or a negative one. Uh, what is your assessment of that? The microphone is yours, Mara. Thank you so much, Mara, for the invitation for the Arab Center uh, for this important talk today. Um, I like to start to focus more on the half um, full <laughs> cup rather than the half empty. I will try to be a little bit positive here so our audience doesn't uh, get too upset. So um, so I would just, my talk, I will start by uh, providing kind of a general overview on the status of women's political representation in the MENA region before and after the uprising and highlight some of the key differences among Arab countries 
And I also want to talk briefly about why women's issues are taking center stage in autocratic uh, regimes across the region now and whether their participation, as you mentioned, is it actually cosmetic and limited or are they actually playing an important role in the decision making process? Which I think is a pretty, it's much more, more complicated question than the, 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 the previous questions you asked. So let me start with the more simple questions. So which are that we all know that MENA region is one of the least democratic regions globally, but it also had one of the lowest rates of female representation in national assemblies over the past decades. They face many sociocultural and structural challenges to, to access the world of uh, formal politics, which we all know is very male dominated as my colleagues here already mentioned. But the scene significantly changed after the Arab uprisings, and with many countries, they took significant steps to increase the presence of women in formal politics, not because autocrats love women's rights or care about them, but it was more about appeasing opponents and attracting additional support bases. But these changes also coincide, coincided with a global pro proliferation of gender quotas. So it's not just a Middle East phenomena that these uh, gender quotas are pro proliferating on different levels, local, uh, subnational, uh, national, but it, it is a global trend with the introduction and adoption of quota systems, gender quota systems, where, which is taking place in both democratic and autocratic uh, states. So in the case of the Middle East, I just kind of mentioned very few examples of the changes in female representation that took place after the uprisings, and I'm happy to answer more and, and elaborate more in the Q&A. So for instance, in Algeria, uh, um, in Algeria in 2012, uh, the a mandatory uh, gender quota was enacted before there was a quota in Algeria pre-2012, but it in, after the, pre, in the 2012, it was a mandatory and parties were required to um, uh, to include the quota assistance proportional to the districts. Party lists were also expanded in Morocco to include 60 seats for women compared to 30 seats before, which is a double uh, 2011, before 2011. And a provisional quota system was implemented in each of 2015 elections. And again, we know that how um, also Tunisia introduced the, the, the phenomenal parity uh, quota system in the constitution, uh, which uh, on the local and the national levels. So as a result, women's presence in the national legislature, legislatures exceeded 10% for the first time ever in 2012. Uh, so however, despite the region, the recent process, the progress, women's representation in the Arab uh, legislatures right now at 2021, according to the ITU data, we are at 18%. But this is very low again, as my colleagues mentioned, compared to the Nordic countries, for instance, who have average 40% and even in Europe where they have about 27%. But also we have to be very careful because these national averages or regional averages, they also mask important variations across cases. So we have some countries that have taken serious measures to bridge the gender gap in politics and introduce constitutional electoral mechanisms, as I just mentioned, but many countries across the region, they have the lowest percentages of women in national legislators in the global level. So we have, uh, and, and again, there's so much variations that I, talk, I can talk more about, about the enforcement mechanism, how the women are, women are placed on lists, even within the quota systems. And this is something that I can elaborate more uh, on later. For instance, we have right now, UAE and Egypt are the pioneering countries in female political representation legislative institutions with 50% in UAE and 27% in Egypt. Uh, however, many countries still have marginal or no female representation in, in, in parliaments such as Oman or Lebanon and Yemen. So there's so much um, variations that us as scholars, we haven't explored enough and we still don't understand how these varying outcomes and what do they mean for female representation and, um, and priorities and preferences of women in these countries. And one thing that I, I also want to mention that the retention of women in politics is very low in, in the region too. So based on my own data set and the work that I do in Arab parliaments, we have the re-election of women in menace legislators is as low as 2%, which is if you compare to their male counterparts, we're talking about about 15%. 
so even after the introduction of gender quota policies. So not just women increased in, so as I mentioned, they did increase after the last decade in the national legislatures, but also this just last year, I tried to do a quick survey of the changes that happened in 2021. Women's representation also, women gained some important steps in the executive branch. So for instance, in Morocco, uh, the authorities appointed uh, Rab Anwar as the first female head prosecutor at a court for the first time ever. And also in Libya, there was a first Libya, Libyan uh, female foreign minister and in Tunisia, of course, the female MP that was uh, appointed by Qais Saeed after the coup. So there, there are some, there are some important changes. There's some, some improvements happening. But, um, but for us to assess, it will take time for us as scholars to assess the impact of these changes and what they are actually doing. So one, to address your point, uh, Tamara, about, so what are these, what is policies? What are they bringing to women? Are they important? Are they not? So I think it's really hard for us to assess the role of or the achievements of women in these legislatures if we don't understand very well why these quota systems were introduced in the very, very, very beginning. So I want to highlight some of the work on why autocrats adopt during the reforms, including gender quotas. Why did, why, did they, why did they even bother? So research, we know that research showed that autocrats, they adopt quotas for very different reasons. They want to improve their international reputation. They want to solidify power. They want to broaden their support basis or appease international donors and supporters. So, so these top-down reforms come in, and then women come in join these legislatures. But they also don't operate in a vacuum. These are they enter these highly male-dominated institutions. They are expected to abide to existing root norms and codes. Uh, they don't have, uh, they don't function in, in a vacuum and the legislative behavior is constrained by several institutional and structural constraints within these legislatures. So based on my own work on Arab parliaments over the past decade, there's so many different uh, observations and, um, and uh, data that supports many of the hypotheses and the arguments that I make about the role of women in these parliaments. And, and I can talk more again uh, if we need to clarify this. So some of the main findings from my work on Arab parliaments and the role that women play in these parliaments, that unsurprisingly, women, they're not a homogenous group. You don't come in with a unified set of preferences and priorities. And it's really simplistic to think about them as one unified group with, with unique preferences. The other thing that I noticed during my work in work field work in the region, how do women do come together to push for gender related reforms, but they have to be very, very urgent pressing reforms, something like the laws, for instance, domestic violence, re the recent introduction of domestic violence laws, the rape marriage laws, the honor killings laws, these laws women really came together and we pushed hard for them, regardless of their ideologies and their ideological orientation or party affiliation. Also, ideology, what I find in my work, that ideology really plays a very minor role for understanding women's behavior in legislative assemblies. Ideology doesn't really, it's not one of the determining factors. And what I also found, which I thought was very, very interesting um, for me and not for others, is that how both men and women are, are, they tend to avoid any sensitive issues that may upset the regime or destabilize the, 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 the autocratic role, the autocrats role. For instance, both men and women, they wouldn't focus on issues like um, defense, corruption, civil liberties, protection of minorities, with very, very few exceptions, but mostly they don't. And I also, as I show in my upcoming book and how women's success in legislative arena is often associated with the strength of their legislative networks that would enable collaboration and coalition building. And the presence of institutionalized parties, which is always lacking in most Arab uh, countries, this is what facilitates this process of collaboration and coalition building. And this is a problem that we, cannot, we need to address about how parties and the role of parties within Arab, Arab uh, politics. The last point that I will end with, and I'm happy to talk more, um, is about 
your concern or, or question about the democratic agenda and how women's agenda is not as important as a democratic agenda, especially in places of conflict or where um, where democratization efforts are, are pretty lacking, lagging behind. But my response to this question, I always get asked this question, it's too late. Women are already in. So it's too late to ignore the women's agenda or the women's priorities because they are. And, and you will be surprised when I started this field work and this project uh, seven years ago, started doing work in the Middle East. I was like everybody else thinking about parliaments, Arab parliaments from the outside, that these parliaments are useless. They're just there to, uh, to, uh, to, to appease and, and work uh, to solidify the autocrat's power. I was very surprised when I started working in these parliaments and seeing what women do within these parliaments. Yes, they are constrained. Yes, there are so many codes and norms that they have to abide to, but they are doing phenomenal work and they're pushing these boundaries very hard. So it's still too early. The, their presence has, they have been like 10, 12 years at most in most of these parliaments. So there, it's pretty early to have a, um, a solid uh, idea what's happening. But it is too late at this point to ignore women's priorities and issues and uh, put their agenda on the side. And I will end here. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Myra, for this. And um, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Isis. Um, Isis, why haven't Arab women's movements reached their goal after um, decades of work um, that were mentioned by um, the other speakers? Um, what measures and policies would create real and lasting progress in the Arab world? Um, and uh, another part of the question that I want to ask you has to do with the West. Um, how is the international or Western media and politics sensationalize, sensationalization of um, Arab and Muslim women impacting this progress? And um, what is your assessment of the call for feminist foreign policies? Um, in the US and, and Europe. Uh, you know, Maiwa mentioned a little bit about, you know, autocratic regimes trying to appease international supporters. And that seems to be a factor here. But is, is that enough or is that realistic to, to call for a feminist foreign policy? Is this? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, of course, being um, the last speaker, um, many of the points have already been mentioned, so I will try to connect with them as much as possible. Um, I will start by uh, talking about women's rights activism briefly in the region and some of the challenges uh, activists face, like um, was mentioned already by the other speakers. It's important to remember the context for each country and that women aren't the same and the context differs whether we're talking about the particular colonial, neo-colonial histories of each country, the sociopolitical conditions, state policies, whether there's war, um, levels of displacement, et cetera. These are all uh, factors that we need to take into account. And as someone who has been working with um, Iraqi, Syrian and Palestinian refugee women for the last uh, 15 years, um, there's um, some similarities, but there are also lots of differences that are based on the particular policies in the countries and what was happening during the war in each of those contexts. Um, the targeting of women's rights activists by the state and the appropriation of state feminist agendas also plays a role in my view before the revolutions and also uh, in part after. Um, as well as the exchange between states and Islamist parties over control of the public and private spheres and control of women's bodies for marking these boundaries. And we saw that when Morsi came to power in Egypt um, after the 2011 revolution, we also see um, uh, certain contestations um, in, in Tunisia as well. We also need to pay attention to the tension between universal rights and national laws and between nationalist and feminist agendas. And I, I think one of the main challenges, in my view, um, relates to women's ability, uh, women's activists or women's rights organization to focus on grassroots work and bridge the gap between rural, urban, class and educational divides. I know um, I work a lot on the Palestinian uh, women's movement, and this is one of the major challenges. Um, that is um, relevant to the building from the bottom up. Um, this also relates to the reliance on outside funding and the professionalization of many of these organizations. And 
um, these are um, crucial challenges that activists are facing. Another challenge focuses on the relation to political parties, uh, and Marwa spoke um, about this. It's her area. I'm just going to mention it uh, briefly. Um, you know, whether we're talking about quota systems, the position of many of those activists within their own parties and how they're negotiating also um, introducing uh, a more feminist agenda in the workings of those parties. We have recently also noticed an increase like Mar Marwa mentioned uh, in women's ability to run for office and in their pre presence and visibility in the political sphere. Even if it's not sustained fully, uh, I think it's important to pay attention to it. Uh, impressive, in my view, is the work done lately by Palestinian women um, here in the United States, and I'm going to talk later about uh, foreign policy and try to make some links. Um, um, the Palestinian Feminist Collective, for example, was established. This is its second year. Um, and what's really important in their work is the focus on the anti-colonial and decolonial agendas and working on building communities um, as feminist activists. And despite um, many of the challenges that I talked about, women's rights activists are still doing impressive work, in my view. And I'm not, you know, I teach and I'm an activist myself. And I can't afford to despair. It's just like there is no place. We have to continue working and continue building and continue um, learning and teaching about those issues. So um, working uh, impressive work on the ground, linking generations of activists, combating violence in the public and private sphere, standing with LGBTQ plus rights and insisting on the indivisibility of rights. And um, one example I will give is the work recently done by feminist activists um, among Palestinians uh, in the 1948 area where I'm from uh, and the ways they are pushing the agenda and pressuring party leaders to take a stand, um, as was the case with uh, um, when they challenged Mansour Abbas. Um, and his homophobic statements in the recent um, Israeli elections um, and activists actually um, in the region generally and those particular activists are challenging uh, hierarchical masculine modes of leadership and maybe during the question and answer we can have more time to talk about this. Of course, creating a democratic space uh, where people can organize and be imagined a different present and future where they can live in dignity is crucial. Uh, we can take um, uh, an example, the 18 days during the Egyptian revolution, where an alternative reality was created on the ground in Tahrir Square, uh, where people organized their lives um, uh, and public spaces according to their beliefs and the community they aspired to live in. Um, looking at the impact, um, like some of you have already mentioned of COVID, um, I'm, I'm extremely concerned um, because it just adds another layer uh, of um, what people have to deal with just to, to survive. So we're, if we're talking about the pandemic, um, we need to take into account the weak infrastructure, um, um, rising unemployment, um, especially among the youth, uh, and now an increase in food prices, um, especially with basic necessities like wheat. Uh, in light of the current war in Ukraine. And here I will try to start making more of the connections between uh, transnational, uh, regional and local um, uh, as they pertain to women's rights in the Middle East. Um, these pose serious challenges in terms of sustaining life, let alone uh, keeping up with the activist work. So the current war uh, in Ukraine showed the hypocrisy and double standards in both media and foreign policy statements and the presentations of the war and especially of war refugees using statements like, uh, and freely, you know, that was the part that uh, was infuriating. People wouldn't even question words like the civilized and free world, or this is not Afghanistan or Iraq, or these are not your Syrian refugees. I mean, using um, racist, ignorant, orientalist, new colonial languages um, to say language to say the least um, was, you know, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but I was still surprised and very angry. The approach of the media stems mostly from a representation that is based on an orientalist view of women in the region that cannot seem to do to go beyond logics of helping and saving without taking into account women's agency, the complexity of the context in which they live and operate. Uh, and looking at these double standards regarding US foreign policy, um, we, we really have to talk about aid as well, uh, military aid in particular. So if we look at the um, Israel um, and how it's given carte blanche to continue its apartheid policies on the ground uh, in Palestine, or if we take Egypt and look at Sisi's um, regime and um, uh, we really have to think about numbers and um, 
You know, the U.S. provided Israel so far with 150 billion in bilateral assistance and missile defense funding for Egypt for 2022. The Biden administration has requested 1.4 billion in bilateral assistance, and the same amount was given last year. There is a $300 million um, amount on hold, depending on human rights. Um, 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 uh, conditions, um, but I'm doubtful, you know, if that will make an impact and will get CC to change um, his policies. Uh, we can talk uh, until further notice about women's rights in Yemen, um, while still continuing to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. So I just want us to kind of think also about the context in which, uh, when this is invoked, for what reason, and also um, why. Um, so what would it take to have a feminist foreign policy, I mean, or foreign agenda? This is maybe a wish list, but um, I want to share it uh, with us before I finish and open the, um, the floor for discussion. Looking at Chile today with the election of um, the new government um, and Gabriel uh, Burici, I see a feminist domestic and foreign um, policy in action. This is actually a place where I, I get hope and it's interesting. Um, I was leading a workshop um, uh, in the region and many people asked me for um, uh, feminist readings on Latin America. So there's lots of interest and maybe people are drawing some parallels in regard to, you know, these the, many Chile lived under a dictatorship and how did they get to where they are today? Um, if we look at the current government, or at least the approach, um, the number of women in the government is not enough. So we're going to go back to the table. But at least the approach is, is transformative, it's collective, it's collaborative, and it's also challenging hierarchies of power structures. Um, it's not enough to have a woman vice president, as is the case in the USA. It's really important to challenge the militarized and masculinist logics of doing politics, going to war, as is the case right now, or even making peace. Um, Costa Rica is another example I would like to bring uh, into the picture where the state actually reallocated and I know they have their own particular histories, but it's really important to also think of the possible. They reallocated the whole defense budget to health and public services, so um, there is a potential at least for thinking about this. Um, we have a record of Sweden's feminist foreign policy that was introduced in 2014, followed by Canadian feminist foreign assistance, <clears throat> excuse me, policy in 2017, announcements by France and Luxembourg in 2019, and most recently the launch of the Mexican feminist foreign policy in January 2020. So are these policies enough? Um, and where is the United States um, in all of this? I'll start by emphasizing the need to take an intersectional feminist perspective that links the economic, social, and political context in which people live. Um, and in my um, view, this will allow for a better understanding and also for the potential for a transformation to take place without really linking these different um, oppressions in both the private and the public sphere and moving away from a model of add women and stir and just numbers and you know the numbers went up and down. Um, I don't think we can go far. In addition, an intersectional approach goes hand in hand with an integrative approach where bodily integrity, protection of the environment, we really have to bring the whole package in because I don't think we can be selective nor can we afford um, to do so. Considering this, we need to start by designing different commitments to world order and to security uh, through rethinking the gender structures of these institutions. So going back to U.S.'s foreign policy, um, what can we do? What do we need to take into account as we do that? Um, gender parity, as many of you have already mentioned, and making women visible in the public sphere is not enough. We need mechanisms that will allow for transformative politics to take place. Uh, we need to challenge patriarchal systems um, and uh, apply equality and justice within those structures uh, and not just um, outside them or uh, on a more um, um, small uh, level. The challenge here goes beyond equal representation. Um, you've talked about the table, I'm bringing the table in because the table <laughs> is important. The number of women at the table doesn't ensure better futures for women unless they can influence the decision-making processes, set their priorities, and also um, bring their concerns 
we need to take those concerns into account. We really have to think about the military industrial complex, um, same way for those of us who do work, the way we think also about the prison industrial complex. Um, think about disarmament, think about institutionalized violence. So when we talk about violence in the domestic sphere, um, we have, um, it's crucially important to link it to violence in the uh, institutionalized for, forms of violence. Uh, we have to talk about economic, economic, social, and political power structures and how war, now we're talking about Ukraine, how war maintains those structures and keeps them in place. Uh, we need to also trace, especially now, how militarization processes take place. Um, it's important to trace, as Enlo says, the step-by-step -step processes that seep into our lives and shape the kind of knowledge and the decisions we, we make um, in those um, situations. Um, we also need to ask uh, whether militarized security could actually bring security, let alone peace. Um, who makes the decisions, who's affected, who benefits, uh, what are the consequences? Um, and I know when I ask all these questions, my students is like, stop, <laughs> let us start answering them one by one. So it's crucially important to think about, um, especially if we were thinking about the questions of credibility and accountability. You know, the US went into Iraq and Afghanistan, pulled out of Afghanistan after 20 years, the level of destruction um, to Iraqi, um, um, to the Iraqi country, the the fabric of life is um, unspeakable. And still, we don't hear a word about accountability. And then we come with agendas to save these women. So the, thinking about those contradictions is important. Uh, and we always um, need to um, keep asking, uh, which rights are we actually protecting? And whose rights are we protecting? Are we actually including the rights of migrants, refugees, stateless people? Um, what are the hierarchies that we, even when we talk about rights, are rights are we maintaining within that. Um, I draw on the work of uh, Kumuskova and Chair who called for a feminist foreign policy that questions the structure, um, that questions and restructures power relations, builds gender inclusive institutions and incorporates the needs of all, not only the selected, um, the select few. Um, and also when talking about women's rights in the Middle East, um, especially, we really, um, I know I'm speaking for myself, I hold two passports, I belong to two places, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I really am I'm always troubled um, in, in thinking about modes of um, uh, building alliances, solidarity, and building community. We are all engaged directly or indirectly in the political economy of war. So um, can we do feminist politics or feminist foreign policy for that matter while keeping our current structures in place? And I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aziz, for this, um, placing you know, the, the feminist agenda within the larger uh, global political system. I think that's very important. Um, we have a few questions coming in. Um, just say um, for the audience, um, please feel free to continue sending in your questions um, via the Zoom Q&A feature or um, by email to events at arabcenterdc.org. Um, the first question is, I just want to ask all of you, um, if you can just address it quickly. Um, you've all mentioned uh, some successes, small, isolated, uh, inspiring cases here and there. But it seems like um, the patriarchal and autocratic systems in, in the region are robust, in a sense. And that, um, you know, uh, Isis mentioned a little bit more about this, the international contradictions continue to operate uh, in the same way as they've been for decades. Um, wh what is your recommendation? What do we need to do now to change this? Or can we change this? Um, if you want to be a little more optimistic than I am. Um, we can go in the same order that, that we started, if, if that's OK, or if anybody would like to start. If, if you have some policy recommendations or recommendation for civil society, how do we change this uh, robust, uh, patriarchal, autocratic international order? Um, Dina, do you want to start? Um, wow, you're asking an impossible question. I mean, my, you know, again, I'm going to repeat what I said. I look to the younger generation. Actually, I think they are stronger. They are uh, less compromising in their ideals. They are fighting against those uh, multi-layered systems of oppression. Um, they are fighting against patriarchy. Um, they are looking at things in a 
through an intersectional lens. They are organic in the way they organize. They do not uh, approach uh, movements in the more traditional way. I think there's a lot of um, uh, crossing borders, crossing issues. Uh, and I really appreciate that about the younger generation. So you know, my hope lies there. That's not an answer to the question, but I pass it on to the rest um, for more details. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'll just briefly go next. Um, you know, I think because this is such an entrenched issue, you know, we really have to have two avenues of, of policy and action here. And one has to be, of course, on the state level. You know, we've seen successes in countries that have used quotas. Look at Rwanda. I mean, just decades after the genocide, they now have the highest female representation in government. Their health sector has expanded exponentially as a result of increased, um, you know, care about, about societal ills like that. So I think on the one track, states themselves need to be reformed. I mean, many of the countries we're talking about, let's keep in mind, these are not, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, these are not democracies. You know, nobody has voted for the monarchy in Saudi Arabia. So until these larger structures are changed, there are going to be limitations and we are, we're going to see um, forms of gender equality used as cynical political ploys as we're seeing in countries like Saudi Arabia until we get some of these calcified structures, you know, to be more representative and democratic. Um, and then there needs to be, I think, change in the household, in the community, in looking at the attitudes and behaviors of families. And this is not just putting the impetus on girls to, you know, pull themselves up. You know, this needs to be internalized by boys and girls, men and women, people of all genders at all ages. Um, and this is, I think, where some of the harder work is going to come because there are deeply entrenched interests using religion, using culture, using history as justifications for why these inequities exist, pointing to the fact that, well, you know, this is the way it's been, or again, like, like we mentioned earlier, it's too disruptive to change. And, you know, this region is already so unstable, you know, we really don't want to add another factor. So I think we really need to challenge those assumptions. Um, we need to ensure that boys know that this is potential, you know, partially on them, we need to ensure that boys are also educated, and, and that they're not falling down the same cycles of previous generations that place the male at the center of the household, of the family, of the decision-making, of the policy-making. Um, you know, I think we are starting to see this simply because so many young people in the region have social media and they see what life is like. Um, and they, they, they want that. They don't want to live a limited life. So I think we need to support grassroots efforts. This cannot be an externally, um, imposed initiative, I think, especially because of some of the hypocrisy that we do see, unfortunately, and, and that kind of ruins that uh, moral case. But I think it is possible. It does take time and it needs to be done without othering or um, treating Muslims, especially or Arabs as some some uniquely flawed group that needs, you know, the, the religion has been used to justify atrocities as long as there's been religion. I mean, colonialism, slavery, all had just, you know, we're all justified with religious texts. So we need to look at these examples, de-exceptionalize the region, and, and also, you know, like all my colleagues have said, keep pushing forward and hope that there will be a generation that sees the fruits of it. Marywa? Yes, um, I would like to highlight two points. I think you had already highlighted the first point that I wanted to emphasize is increasing women's uh, participation in politics and representation, um, both in both as um, in decision making processes as in the executive uh, level too. So ministers and cabinet members and so on. So, so I think this is a very important step. The, the, and, and, and introducing these legislations and more quota systems, because not all Arab states have quota systems yet, as I mentioned, and this is, and women are having really hard time getting, accessing politics in places where there is no quota system in place, as one of my um, participants here mentioned in the, in the chat about Lebanon, for instance, because of the absence of a quota system. Um, so 
the way to make this sustainable for women to continue to make gains and uh, gain influence and power in the political realm, they need to be to, to let them in and they stay in for a while to understand the rules of the game so they can play the, the, the game of politics that males have been doing for decades. So this is the first point that I would like to highlight. I think the second point is, is economic representation and economic participation. As um, Lena mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, and it's a very important point about the very low levels of female economic participation in the region. I was very shocked when I read the gender gap, the global gender gap index report uh, just released a few weeks ago to know that uh, women, women make 22% of the, their, their income is 22% of men's income in Egypt and 24% of men's income in Saudi Arabia and, and, and actually 12% of men's income in Iraq. So even those who are in the workforce and working, they're not there yet. So, and this is very problematic and it needs serious measures and serious policies that are just on the paper. Policies are implemented and taken seriously. So there's so many things that we can talk about in women's economic empowerment, like mobility issues that we have in the region. We have the sexual harassment at work, informal work. We have so many issues that we can talk about in, when it comes to women's economic empowerment. But I would emphasize these two points, it's political empowerment and leadership and economic empowerment. Thank you, Marwa. Isis, do you want to address the question? I'll be brief because I think my presentation addressed some, some of the issues. Um, for me, um, I think part of the solution is here. So making the connections between the here and there is really important and not assume that um, what happens in the Middle East is functioning in isolation of what takes place, especially that the US is, um, we have aid, we have military aid, we have military alliances. Um, there's also a place of modeling and actually um, thinking about doing politics differently. Um, um, creating alternatives, um, even if they're on a small level, I think makes a big difference. Um, what happened uh, after, you know, in 2010, 2011 and after is not something we, we can ignore, right? People develop certain mechanisms for dealing with these issues, for bringing these issues to the fore. And I think it's important to continue building on those while recognizing, like we said, the context specific, um, um, uh, the, while being um, specific to the context in each one of those countries. Thank you. Oh, and maybe one last point relates to also to the transnational feminist movement. Um, instead of you know coming, I'm talking here to um, the American uh, people in the um, in the audience. Instead of coming always with the agenda of saving, I mean, really looking at ways of building alliances, of truly uh, standing on solidarity, of understanding what the issues are, and also looking at ourselves and what's happening in this country in terms of. Um, you know, gender violence and, and the institutionalized mechanisms that sustain it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start uh, going through questions from the online audience. Um, we do have a question about religion and um, that tends to be, you know, the West's favorite questions when we talk about uh, women's rights in, in, in the Arab world. Um, the question um, says, how does the fight for gender equality deal with the Islamic religious authorities who oppose it? Um, I think, um, you know, Yara mentioned a little bit about this, but um, all of you are welcome to, to address this issue because it, it does tend to be uh, the first question that we all get asked every time we talk about uh, women's rights and, and the status of women in the Arab world. Um, I'll, just uh, read three questions and then we'll do three questions at a time. Um, there's a question about um, uh, women's activism uh, in the Arab world. Uh, the question says, how do women in MENA unite and radically change uh, the cultural social standards uh, regarding women's second class status throughout the region? Um, and I think some of you have mentioned uh, a little bit about this. If you wanna elaborate um, more, um, there is a question about um, the lack of democratic governance and freedom of speech in, in the Arab world and how um, that, how does that impact the rights of women? Um, do you see women's rights improving uh, if democratic governance is practiced? 
um, it will start with these three questions and then I'll, I'll give all of you a chance to um, respond to uh, one, two or, or three of them as, uh, as you wish. Um, and, you know, we'll just, who would like to, to start? Maria, do you want to address the question about, um, you know, whether women's rights will improve under a democratic government? Yes, sure. I can address this question. Um, so, so I, I, of course, I agree that if there is more democratic openings and more democratization in the region, uh, women's rights will uh, will be better presented and uh, and pushed for. This is true, but I also I think it is it is. It's dangerous to, to wait until democracy hits, and then we say um, we will. Well, okay. Well, there's no democracy. There's no freedom of speech. Like, what are we going to do? Let's wait until the region democratized. It is an exceptional region, as we all know, we all know, and we just say, oh, let's wait until they democratize, and then they will fix the women's issues. So I, I don't think this is an argument that we can afford to to do right now, especially with the with the after their uprising in the region and how these regimes manage to sort of defy power and stay and stay longer and become out, come out of the corona, come out of the uprisings even more stronger. And also I, I, I and there is also this global trend of autocrat autocratization throughout the world. It's not just the Middle East. So I don't think we need to wait or we, we can afford to wait for democracy to hit in the region for so we can wait for women's rights to improve. And as I always tell my students, and I always say everywhere, autocrats do not think of women's rights as an area this is threatening for them. This is why they're willing to take steps to improve women's rights. For them, it is much better. They're gonna make they're gonna look very good in international arena. They will get more money from donors for programs that would support women's rights, whatever um, they, they define it, and they will also gain loss of popularity domestically. So they do not think of women's rights as an intimidating or a threatening issue rather than the US coming in and telling them do fair elections or include more uh, more opposition figures in parliaments or or include them in your cabinets. So so I don't I think it will be all good if we have more democracy in the region, but I don't think we need to wait until democracy actually happens. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that, you know, I, most of us, I think, on the panel are sitting in the United States, you know, supposedly the beacon of democracy in the world, and we are nothing close to gender egalitarian, nor fully democratic, as we've learned in, in recent years, especially. Um, and in fact, nobody watching this, no matter where you are, is sitting in a country with gender equality. And I assume that most people are not just watching from a, a Muslim country. So. Um, I think to pin gender inequality primarily on any religion um, is is really limiting, and it's trying to simplify an answer to a complex question that is rooted, you know, as as we've spent an hour discussing in so many complex historical, cultural, economic factors um, and governmental factors um, that we can't um, ignore the roles of religion in 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 perpetuating these uh, you know, inequalities, but in, even in the United States, when we're seeing laws outlawing abortion or outlawing other women's issues, you know, many of the same politicians are quoting you know, religious texts as well. So I don't think any religious text, when you cherry pick, uh, looks particularly great for women. Um, so I think we have to be careful about exceptionalize it. I mean, this is the problem with the Middle East. It is always exceptionalized. It's just the region. It's just such a mess. You know, it's, it's, you know, there's any number of, uh, you know, metaphors that people use specifically about the Middle East. And, and while so many of these problems are amplified there, again, by design, in many cases, we see these instances everywhere. So I think um, for anyone who's sitting in a country that's not gender equal, which again is everyone, um, I think we need to consider what is cause, what assumptions and biases are causing gender inequalities where I sit. It's probably similar for the Middle East as well, even though there's this religious tinge to it. And we need to, again, like I stated, de-exceptionalize the fight for equality as something that specifically Muslim women have to fight for. This is a 
this is something women have had to fight for and bravely for hundreds of years in every country, in every empire, in every, you know, every settled society. Um, so the Middle East is no different. And it just has this last century or so of significant instability due to, again, a complex mix of natural resources, of autocracy, of um, lack of, of, of a foreign intervention. I mean, let's remember that the quote unquote war on terror was partly justified by the call to liberate these poor Muslim women, right? And that liberation primarily came in the form of occupying and destroying their countries. So I think we have to be very careful about what we consider um, limitations on gender equality and, and how external interventions are actually benefiting and if they are at all. I think we need to all be a little more self-aware. Thank you, Yara. Um, Alina, do you want to address the question about um, how Arab women are uniting to uh, sure. create a change? Sure. I mean, um, I just want to echo uh, Yara's comments and applaud wildly. That's absolutely right. Because the part of part of the question about how do Arab women unite is uh, the assumption that they are second class citizens, I believe was the question. And, you know, I would argue uh, that's true just existing in a female body everywhere. Um, for instance, look at Texas. I would argue that women are second class citizens there. Um, and in many other places around the world, like I said, nowhere has achieved equality. So this isn't just about Arab women, other women over there. It's every one of us and all of us. But we can hold that thought and also understand that, yes, the region has um, some depressing social indicators and a wide gender gap and a long way to go. Uh, along with other countries and regions as well. So how are women organizing? When we talked about social media. I think that's an obvious way. I think uh, there is a lot of inspiration that is being gained from global movements uh, that are kind of organic and intersectional global feminist movements. Um, I look to things like She Decides, which is a global movement for sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, Women Deliver, um, and these organizations, AWID also, they do a lot supporting um, young women and activists around the world. And again, you know, young women's leadership, I'm ready to retire, please take over. Um, could we do more organizing at the regional level and crossing some of those national barriers? I'd like to see that. Um, I think there is more room for that. I think it's starting to happen. Um, I think there is a lot of potential in that space. Uh, there are lots of strong kind of independent voices. You know, would they be louder if they were all together? Absolutely. Um, I think there is uh, a sense that no one is going to do this for us. We have to do it ourselves. So the idea of building uh, that solidarity and support to drive forward change faster you know, could be coming. Um, I would like to find ways to expedite that and look at all of us you know, who have been working maybe internationally for, for decades to see what we might be able to do um, as mentors and role models to support um, the other gener the next generation coming forward. Thank you, Lina. And Isis, I want to um, address the next question to you. Um, Marwa mentioned a little bit um, about how autocratic regimes don't view um, women's rights as um, the enemy or as, as a threat to them. And there's a question about Saudi Arabia and Egypt and how the state improved women's rights after a major power grab, like um, you know the, the coup in Egypt, the Ritz Carlton incident in, in Saudi Arabia. Are these Arab despots um, using women's rights as a tool against their critics? Um, are they um, you know, using this just to appease the West without actually um, making a real uh, effort to uh, support women's rights? And then just, I wanna add the other side of the questions. Do um, Western governments have responsibility to uh, to pressure or to, pro to put more pressure um, on, on, on these governments, especially, you know, conditioning aid and so on. Uh, 
I mean, it's not an easy, and maybe Marwa is in better position because she, if you look closely at issues of representation or policies in both um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, um, what I know is I know that uh, women also, even when it's not intended to, to quote unquote, you know, bring democracy, they seize on opportunities. So if the law is changed, that doesn't mean that they don't take advantage, whether it's coming from pressure from the United States or the European Union, etc. But for me, the, the, the important question is the transformative element and to thinking about rights in ways that they are applied that hold dignity. So if we're talking about Egypt and you know some changes were made and some of them were positive after 2011, but when you live in a reality where you can't actually open your mouth um, to express opposition to the regime, et cetera, it's a contradictory reality. Or when we look at aid, for example, when, when you give countries so much military aid and then come and call for democracy. So I think, living through these contradictions is, is something not just we as academics you know sitting comfort comfortably uh, you know in, in our um in our um locations um in the united states etc are doing but people negotiate also on a daily basis with these very very difficult questions and i know uh, for uh, for Saudi Arabia, for example, there's pressure from the inside, you know, whatever happens that the state needs to answer to, they can't just, you know, keep going as if nothing had happened in the last um, 10 years. The question is, we have openings, what's being done or how these negotiations take place and what kind of alliances, this is why I go back to talking about solidarity and solidarity here go go beyond you know solidarity um, goes beyond just signing a petition or being informed about the issues. It's really building um, movements and and standing. And you know when when Aza Suleiman, for example, came let, letters came from all over the world, right? In support. Um, what does this mean? And not in support of saving her, but really holding the. The, both the Egyptian re regime accountable, but also holding the US that gives them so much money accountable. So how creative we need to be in crossing these boundaries. This is why, I mean, statistics are important, but I feel always very, um, I can't just remain on that level because it's very depressing and I feel it stops the conversation. So whatever the statistics are, there are always realities on the ground and people are trying to do things that go beyond the numbers and they are creating alternatives that sometimes are not even recorded by anyone. So this I want to emphasize just in terms of how we approach the issue, how we deal with it, but also our own, like I tried to emphasize in my own presentation, our own also positionality in relation to it and involvement in it. Thank you, Aziz, for this. And um, we have about four minutes left, so I'm just going to read the last question and, and, and we'll start with Marwa, and then I'll give each one of you about a minute uh, to give you know your final thoughts or any closing remarks or anything that um, you you wanted to address in the questions. Uh, the question, uh, Marwa, is uh, why um, is women per women's participation in politics not sustainable? And you've mentioned that a little bit. And uh, the the, per the the member of the audience here gives an example of Lebanon. Um, are women women temporarily holding the seats for their sons, uh, such as in, in Lebanon? Um, if you want to answer this question, we'll start with Marwa and then give your final thoughts um, for concluding remarks as well. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, I think the way for female sustainable political representation in MANA is to introduce the more gender quotas and increasing them over time. So the whole, what is the purpose of gender quotas? Gender quotas supposedly, they open the door for women to come in it's kind of like a medication, it can be a short term or a long term. And this is how actually female MPs throughout the region see them, that these are remedies for a deep issue that they're having. But the goal of these quotas is to open the door and so the door can remain open and women can get elected beyond quota seats. Until these days, we're not seeing women being elected, or maybe in Morocco, few seats, in Jordan, few seats, but where women are not getting elected beyond the, 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 the quota seats. So this is why going back to the, to the uh, example of Lebanon that uh, the, the participant raised, um, and thank you for raising this example. Lebanon, again, I hate to say this, but, you, you, but Lebanon is a little bit different in the sense because um, all my interviews and conversations with uh, politicians and in peace in Jordan and in Lebanon, they all say we already have a sectarian quota. We cannot add um, a, a gender quota on top of a sectarian quota, which would just really complicate the scene. We already have a very complicated way 
of um, of elections, and and we are we all know how how the the, the, the parliament the parliament in Lebanon is really challenging not just to pass but even to form uh, uh, and so on so so Lebanon is unique in the sense because of the existence of the sectarian quota but for the rest of the Middle East I would I'm a big advocate of gender quotas until this glass ceiling is shattered and it, we were not seeing this ceiling shattered yet not yet perceptions of cycle the perceptions are not did not change yet. Democratic practices are not introduced yet. There's nothing changed. So we need to continue having these gender quotas until women actually make it and make a real difference from a policy perspective. Thank you, Marwa. Um, Nina, do you want to give your final comments? Sure. We started with uh, your comment that I hate International Women's Day, and, and I still do hate it. And the reason is, you know, I wonder why we have squeezed ourselves into one day or one month to have these kinds of conversations with the same people in the echo chamber. And I've said this at every single panel because now I'm doing three or four a day. I roll from one to the other and I ask the same question. Who's in the audience that wouldn't otherwise have been here? Is there somebody new and, and different that we're reaching out to? Are we we're doing things the same way year after year? It's a, we're existing in a bit of a vacuum. So I wonder how are we talking about women's rights and gender equality to an audience that is outside our very small circle of people who are already converted. You know, where is our outreach to the so-called movable middle? You know, the entrenched opposition is one thing, the converted, which would be us, all of us, and presumably this audience is another thing. But there are people out there who are not going to come to panels and attend and listen in um, and perhaps not have the opportunity to be swayed because you know, I think this argument is extremely convincing. It's logical. It's a no brainer. Um, women's rights uh, should have been fulfilled. But many people assume that they already are. They have no idea the extent of inequality, not just the Arab region, but everywhere. So how are we reaching those people? I think we need to rethink our modalities um, for the years, to, uh, for the months to come and the years to come. Thank you, Isis. Do you want to give your final comments? No, I, I asked the same question. I mean, why why in March, in addition to its midterms and it's a really tough time? I'm <laughs> just kidding. But uh, why why only one month? I mean, I understand the recognition, but we can't really ignore these issues the rest of the year. So how we continue engaging with them on a daily basis, I would say, yeah, is, is important. And making those connections are, is important. I mean, from our locations, um, all of us, uh, whatever that location is, we can do a lot. Um, thank you. Thank you, Yara. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Tamara, and thanks to all the fellow panelists. Um, I would just like to end by by saying, you know, I think we just we need to have a historical view of this. You know, undoubtedly today the, the Middle East is disproportionately um, a, a highly unequal place for women, to put it euphemistically. This is undeniable, and I don't think any of us on this panel would disagree with that. Um, but again, these are new countries with significant amounts of foreign interference, you know, a lot of complex factors. I mean, the US has been run almost exclusively by men for centuries, more than 200 years after the founding of the country. We just now have a female vice president and, and that was seen as, you know, this kind of huge turning point. Um, so I think struggle is long, you know, oppression is built in and it's very hard to overcome. And so I think we just need to have um, we need to keep having discussions. We need to keep pushing for uh, egalitarian policies and supporting households that have egalitarian views. And, and I think we're already seeing in benefits in our time. I mean, again, looking at the, the women in my own family, what my grandmother was able to achieve versus what I'm able to achieve is exponentially different. So there is, I think, hope and, and hopefully we can end on that note. <laughs> Thank you, Yara. And um, I would just uh, reiterate um, that, you know, this is a, a, an important issue that needs to be uh, addressed and recognized every day, not just uh, on International Women's Day and <clears throat> not only in March, but I also um, just as a conclusion from everything we've, we've heard from all of you today, um, we really need a comprehensive hall of society approach, not only the legal system or the legal frameworks, but also in the educational system, you know, across society, even the business sector um, needs to be involved in, 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 in this in order to, and, and international agencies and, and Western governments in order to um, achieve uh, a lasting 
uh, change. And uh, with this, we've come to the end of, of uh, the webinar for today. Uh, on behalf of Arab Center Washington DC, I would like to thank all the speakers. Thank you for your time and for your insight, insightful contributions. It's been a great discussion and we need more and more of these um, every day uh, and every month. Uh, I would like to thank all the audiences for joining us today. Uh, the video of the discussion will be available on our website later today. Uh, thanks again, and um, we invite you to continue to follow our work at ArabCenterDC.org. Uh, thanks, everyone, and take care.